The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, in chapter 6 and verse 33, the 33rd verse in the 6th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, in those words, our Lord uh, brings to a head and to a point the various things that he's been putting before these disciples of his and others who were listening to him as he preached what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. What he's concerned to do here, He's concerned to do here, of course, is to give a general view and picture of his kingdom, of what he had come into the world to do. And at the very beginning of his ministry, he wants to make it perfectly plain and clear to the people as to what he is proposing to do. And so he preaches this sermon, and he takes up various matters in it. But ever and again in the sermon, he makes one of these general statements in which he, as it were, sums up the whole position, the entire teaching. Now, the verse we're going to look at tonight is an example and an illustration of that very thing. Here, as it were, in a single verse, we have the essence of the Christian message, the Christian gospel. And I want to try to show you how in this one statement all its essential characteristics are put before us and are emphasized for us. And this becomes particularly true of it when, as I say, we take it in its setting and in its context. Now, my reason for calling your attention to this is that I'm anxious that we should all be perfectly clear as to the nature of this gospel. We were looking last Sunday night at a, a similar statement, the announcement of the beginning of the ministry of our Lord himself. And we looked at that for the same reason. We read uh, now after that John was put into prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is at hand, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, there it was. He says, listen, I have come to bring in this kingdom of God. This which has been promised throughout the centuries has come. It's drawn near to you. That was his message. He is the king, and he makes his great proclamation and announcement concerning the kingdom. And there we saw that certain essential aspects of his doctrine, his message, his teaching, were stated clearly before us. Now, we have a similar statement here in this verse this evening. And as I say, I'm calling attention to this, oh, because of the tragic and the terrible confusion that is so obvious at the present time with regard to what Christianity really is. There is this utter confusion. Men and women are bewildered. And as I said last Sunday night, I have a great deal of sympathy with them in their bewilderment. If one took one's notion of Christianity from the newspapers and certain popular books, one could end in nothing but confusion. But thank God, we needn't turn to such sources for our information. We have here these authentic Gospels. We have here these documents produced by the early church. Indeed, we know nothing about the Lord Jesus Christ apart from what we are told here. All else is mere conjecture. Mere imagination, mere supposition. There's only one thing to do. We must go back and discover what it was the first preachers preached. And we must go right back to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And here I say, in this very Sermon on the Mount, he puts before us in a clear and unmistakable manner what are obviously the very bare essentials of his message, of his proclamation. Now, as we look at this statement, uh, there are certain general points which strike one at once. And then there are certain particular emphases uh, which are also equally evident. 
Let me invite you for a moment to look at these general points which strike us here on the very surface of the statement. The first is, surely, that this gospel, this message of the Lord Jesus Christ, this New Testament message, this Christian message, is something which is altogether and entirely different from everything that has appeared before it, from everything that men thinks of instinctively and believes by nature. The gospel seems to come in the first instance, therefore, as a challenge to us and as a condemnation of what we have habitually believed. Now, you notice our Lord puts it like this. He says, uh, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Then, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now, let's remember that our Lord was preaching to Jews. He was preaching to people who had got their Old Testament scriptures, who regarded themselves as the people of God, who were concerned about God and about righteousness, and the division of the ancient world was, of course, Jews and Gentiles. These who had got this religion and those who hadn't got it. Well, now that's an equally appropriate classification in our day and age and generation. The Gentiles are those who don't know the revelation. The Gentiles are those who trust to their own thoughts and their own ideas. The Gentiles are those who live as if God had never been pleased to reveal anything at all concerning himself. So you see, the division is appropriate as appropriate tonight as it ever has been. And the point I'm making is that our Lord emphasizes this great thing that what he teaches is altogether different from the view of the Gentiles, altogether different from everything that had ever been thought by men or conjured up in men's mind or imagination. Now, this is again a very important preliminary point which we must never lose sight of. The Christian position is not only slightly different from every other, it is essentially different. It is something that stands out alone and unique and apart. And here it is in these very words that are here uttered by our law. The Christian way of life is a life that is altogether different from every other. But let me put that secondly in this way. To say that is another way of saying this. That according to this teaching, the trouble with men as he is by nature and the cause of his troubled world and all his ills and all his problems and all his vexations, the cause of all that is not something superficial. It is something, on the other hand, which is very deep and very radical and very profound. Now, I say that because of the very words that our Lord uses, seek ye first. Where's your emphasis? What's the first thing? In other words, he's concerned with first principles. Now, there are many people who seem to think that uh, the criticism which uh, Christianity makes of the natural man, of men as he is by nature, the human philosopher, the human thinker, there are many who think that the criticism of Christianity against all such is that they're just wrong at certain particular points, that they're defective here and need a little bit more there, but that uh, there's nothing radical. So many people think that the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is that the Christian's a little bit better than the other man. He's added on certain things. He stopped doing certain things. But that uh, there is no profound change, no essential change, no radical change taking place. But now that is, of course, according to this teaching, a complete and an utter fallacy. Did you notice the words that our Lord keeps on using? I've already mentioned one, and that is first. But he's got another one. And that is the heart. He says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. 
In other words, he says, the difference between my teaching and the other teachings is one that applies to the heart. Now, the heart is the very center of life and of being. So, you see, it isn't something just on the surface. It is something in the deepest, the most central part of men. And then, in order to make it still more clear, he uses this analogy and illustration about the eye. He says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body also shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? You see, he's concerned about the eye again. This central organ through which all the light is going to enter into every part of the body. In other words, he says, the trouble isn't in some little finger or in just a hand or something like that, some odd portion of the body. No, no, it's right at the center. Now, this is clearly and obviously a most important principle, therefore. Christianity, I say, says that man's trouble is in his heart, in his ultimate power of vision and understanding. It isn't that man's partially wrong. He's all wrong. He's looking in the wrong direction. He's blinded at the most vital point. The organ that keeps man, man going is itself in trouble, the heart. So you see, he puts this great emphasis upon first and heart and eye. And this is just a pictorial way of saying that what the human race needs tonight is not to be improved a little bit here and there. That's been the fatal fallacy, surely of the last hundred years in particular. That is the fatal fallacy of all those who think that by social enactments or political enactments that the world can be put in order. Now that is the exact opposite of this teaching. Here is a teaching which says that man's trouble is much too deep for that. It's much too radical. It's much too profound. Man doesn't need to be patched up. Man doesn't just need a coat of varnish or a little improvement here and there. Man needs to be radically changed. Which is just another way, of course, of putting the great New Testament doctrine which says you must be born again. Man needs to be new from the depths, from the foundation, from his very rudiments. Here is a way of life that is altogether and entirely different and which says that man is not merely partially wrong, he's essentially altogether wrong. And so, the third general point which it makes is this. It calls us to a great act of committal. Seek ye first. You see, what he means is this. It isn't just a point of view. It isn't just something to be argued about. Christianity is a way of life. And it's a way of life that demands a total committal. It's a totalitarian demand, if you like. It doesn't merely ask that we consider it and say, Oh, yes, well, I can take on that teaching. That's a good emphasis there. I'll add that now, now. It's not something for an armchair philosopher. It's not something to be argued and debated about. It's not something to be applied as we think and when and where. No, no, he says, seek ye first. He demands an utter, absolute committal. In other words, uh, let me put it in this form. No man, as it were, will ever know the truth of Christianity or the blessings that it can give until he has given himself to it. You can examine Christianity from the outside, you'll never know it, you'll never get it. If any man willeth to do my will, says our Lord, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God. There is a great fundamental principle about this way of life. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You will never know that the Lord is good until you've tested him, until you've tried him. You see, so many of us are like a man standing in an orchard, and there we look at an apple tree or a pear tree, 
And we examine it at a distance. Somebody says, you know, that's got a most wonderful flavor, that. If only you tasted it, you'd say it's the most wonderful fruit you've ever tasted in your life. But the man looks on, and he's not quite satisfied, he's not convinced. And he can argue, he can stay there for days, and as long as you like. He will never know until he takes it and puts it in his mouth, and bites it and proves it. Taste. And see that the Lord is good. A theoretical examination of Christianity will never bring a man anywhere. Our Lord always calls for a committal. If any man, he says, will be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That was his great word. Follow me. You find it running right through the pages of these four Gospels. Very well, I say, it is a way of life to which a man has got to commit himself, to which he abandons himself, listening to this blessed speaker who stands before us. Well, now, there are the three main general characteristics of this message. And it's very important, I say, that we should always bear them in our minds. Unless we are clear about these things, there's little point in proceeding. This is something that has come from heaven. His claim is that he is the Son of God. He is the fulfillment of all the prophecies. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's come. It's arrived. That's his claim. He says, I'm absolutely unique. Listen to me. Come after me. And it's something I say that a man had never thought of, that no one ever would have imagined. It cuts right across all our ideas. It is something which is entirely apart. Well, now, let's see how our Lord works out those three general principles in a particular manner, in a detailed manner. For that is what he does in this statement. The first thing he tells us, therefore, in detail is this, that all men's troubles are due to the fact that he's got a false view of life. That's his big point, isn't it? Why is the world in trouble? Why is the world as it is tonight? Why are we all what we are? Why isn't every man in the world perfectly happy and at ease and contented and enjoying life to the full? What's the matter? Nobody will dispute the proposition that this world is a world of sorrow. It's a world of pain. It's a world of unhappiness. But why? Now, that's the first question, surely. Why are things as they are? And our Lord's answer is quite simple. It's, he says it's all due to the fact that man, as he is by nature, has a false view of life. That's the trouble, he says, with the Gentiles. The Gentiles were living a terrible kind of life. There are many descriptions given of it in the pages of the New Testament, particularly in the epistles, and you'll find hints at it in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. But why were they living like that? Well, the answer is, as a man thinks, so he does. You see, it's our view of life that determines how we live. And if our view of life is wrong, well, obviously everything else is going to be wrong. If the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? If the lens, the focus is wrong, what can be right? The everything is controlled by the eye in this matter of light. And if the eye is not single, if it's double or if there are opacities, well, obviously everything that passes through is going to be affected by it. Now, that's our Lord's teaching. And he says that is the whole tragedy of the world. That its view of life is altogether wrong. That man by nature always puts the wrong things first. You see, a man proclaims what he is by his priorities. You can always tell by what a man is by what he puts first. Doesn't matter what a man says. It's what he puts first that really comes first. There's no question about that, is there? He displays it. All his protestations and everything else, they're of very little value. It's what the man does in practice, what he really does in action, that tells us exactly what he believes. It is his order of priorities that matter. 
You can work that out for yourselves, but how true it is, and we all know how perfectly true it is. What are the things we hold on to? What are the things we shed first? There are endless illustrations of this, aren't there? Let me put it to you in terms of a congregation. I'm not saying this by way of criticism. I'm just putting it as a way in which we can conveniently test ourselves. We are put off from attending house, the house of God by various things, aren't we? Would we be put off in the same way by the same things from going to a theater or a cinema? That's how you test your priorities. What you put first. What is it that has to go first? What's the last thing you let go? That's your priority. That's the ultimate thing you hold on to. And our priorities proclaim our point of view. It's what we put first. Well, now then, according to our Lord, the trouble with mankind is that it puts the wrong things first. Man thinks he knows what he needs. That's why the world is not Christian tonight. That's why 90% of the people of this country are not in places of worship tonight. They think they know what they need. They think they know what makes life. They think they know what makes for happiness. And men thinking that he knows what his needs are, he thinks that all you've got to do is to attend to them and that all will be well. Well, now then, what are these needs? What are the priorities? Well, our Lord has listed them for us. And they're as true tonight as they were 2,000 years ago. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. But that's what man does, what he's always done. Money. Money has almost invariably been one of the chief priorities with men because he's believed that if only you've got money, why you can get anything. Money's power. The man who's got money is the man who's going to control. And the man who's got money he can buy whatever he wants. He can buy happiness. He can buy anything. Money. What a power money is. So man puts as his chief priority money. And our Lord says... That's how the Gentiles are living, laying up for themselves treasures upon earth. And where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There's no question about it. What else? Well, he says, food and drink. The world spends a great deal of its time in considering this. I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. That, but that's what men and women are doing. And they keep on talking about it. So he comes back to it and he says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? He says, These are people's priorities. And to them the big thing in life is, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? I can't be happy unless I eat, unless I drink, of course. Look at the thousands of people in the world tonight whose happiness depends entirely and solely upon food and drink, and especially drink. And then, of course, this matter of clothing. What shall we put on? How shall we appear before people? That's the way to be happy, is to impress people. With your beauty or your greatness or this or that, your elegance. Ah, and immediately everybody looks at you with admiration and you're perfectly happy. And you sleep, put your head on your pillow at night with great contentment. You've achieved your objective. Money, food, drink, clothing. These are the things, says our Lord, for which people live. In other, world, in other words, you see, he says that the tragedy of life is due to the fact that men and women are living and are thinking as if they were but bodies. The thought, the attention, the planning, the scheming, the thinking, all goes in the realm of the body. They conceive of themselves as if they were but animals. That's what animals do. They eat and they drink and so on. So does men. And these are the things he talks about. And as you see a peacock preening himself... So does man, so does woman. What I put on, the impression I make, they live for these things, says our Lord. And hence, all the trouble. And, of course, there's other thing he mentions, the extension of your life in this world. He puts it in these words, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? What that really means is, which of you, by taking thought, can add one inch, as it were, to your duration of life? 
But that's what people are interested in, to live longer, to prolong life, and all the care and the thought and the attention. I'm not saying that this is wrong. Certainly, thank God for medicine. Thank God, if you like, for your National Health Service. Thank God for the cure of diseases. Thank God for the extension of life. But, says our Lord, do you make that your priority? Is that the thing that you're living for? Are you thinking of it in terms of existence only? No, he says, that's what the Gentiles do. And there is no doubt at all about it this evening, but that this is what constitutes life. For the vast majority of men and women in this country, their happiness depends upon the amount of money they have, food, drink, clothing, extension of life. This is happiness, this is life. They don't think about anything else. But you see, according to our Lord, this is all wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, I'll tell you when we come to the second heading, the main reason why it's wrong. But before we come to that, I can tell you this in passing. It is wrong because it always leads to slavery. He puts it like this. No man can serve two masters. You can't, in other words, be a slave to two masters at the same time. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, here is where the gospel comes in as a sword always. The gospel says it's either the one or the other. Now, the gospel doesn't condemn money, root and branch. Let's make no mistake about that. A man is to be a steward and he can use money in a right way. There's nothing wrong in money in and of itself. But what is condemned is that a man should serve it, that he should live for it, that he should be mastered by it, that it should govern his whole outlook, and that he becomes its slave. You can't serve God and men. But the fact of the matter is that that view of life always leads to slavery. And the world is living in slavery tonight. Slavery to money, the desire for money, the power of money. The slavery of the social round, eating and drinking and clothing. What a horrible slavery it is. Now, I'm not saying these things. You can read this sort of thing in medical journals. They're having a great problem in the United States of America at the present time over this very thing. They call it the suburban disease, the suburban complex, if you like. The strain on the suburban woman in America, keeping up with her neighbors in food and drink and house and clothing and motor car, and it's getting them down. It's creating a psychological problem. Now, that's slavery. And the teaching of the Bible from beginning to end is this, that if a man gives himself to these things, he always becomes their slave. He's governed by them. He's mastered by them. He's no longer free. He's dominated his whole life, is determined by them. That's why it's partly wrong, because it always leads to slavery. But then he mentions another thing it leads to. And it's a part of the slavery, of course, and that is that it always leads to anxiety and to worry and to fear. That's what he's talking about. When he says, take no thought for your life, he means don't have an anxious care. This translation isn't quite as good as it should be here. Take no thought means, oh, don't be worried, don't be anxious, don't, don't have an anxiety complex. Do take no thought for your life, what he shall eat or what he shall drink, or, or yet for the body what we shall put on. He is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air and so on. Why are you so anxious about all this? Then again, take no thought for raiment. Consider the lilies. Our Lord's whole teaching here is a repetition of this take no thought. Don't be anxious, don't be burdened, don't be worried. But you know, people who live for things like that always are anxious. They always are worried. They're always full of fear. They're anxious that they're not as good as somebody else or that they haven't got as much as somebody else. They're afraid that they're going to lose what they've got. Do you know there are so many people in this country tonight, if they lost their money, they'd be finished. They'd be done for. 
If they couldn't buy their pleasure, if they had to sell their house, if they had to go without their car, if they couldn't dress any, they'd be finished. Everything they've lived for would have gone. And they're fearful and anxious and apprehensive. Is a war coming? Am I going to lose my health? They live in a constant condition of fear and dread. That is why this is the age of phenobarbiton and the tranquilizers. It's supposed to be the affluent age, I know, but it's at the same time the age of anxiety, the age of strain, the age of frayed nerves, the age of the complexes. It's inevitable. The modern age is proving the rightness of our Lord's teaching. You cannot live for these things, you cannot have these things as your priorities, ex except you become their slave. And the slavery will show itself in the strain, the anxiety, the worry, the fear. They never really satisfy. They never really leave one at ease. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. Yes, it's perfectly true. You're not safe. There are always others trying to get at you. I was reading again in a medical journal about big business in America and the strain on the men at the top. It's reached a point at which they can't trust anybody else. They're afraid that all these others are manipulating, waiting for the opportunity to strike. Uneasy lies the head that wears the crown. So if you live for these things, if you're governed by ambition and by your own ideas of life in this line, uneasy lies the head. There is never rest nor peace. There is never an ultimate satisfaction. But let us leave that and come to the second heading. There it is then, man's troubles are all due to the fact that he has a wrong view of life. He's got the wrong priorities. So it follows in the second place that man's first and chiefest need is to get a right and a true view of life. Here it is. Seek ye first, introduced with the word but. Don't do that, he says, but. Seek first. Now then, here is the right view. Here are the true priorities. And this emphasis is not only central to our Lord's own teaching. This is the great teaching of the Bible from the very beginning to the very end. What are the priorities? What are the things I ought to be thinking of tonight instead of food and drink and money and clothing and all these other things? Well, here they are. Oh, start by thinking about yourself, says our Lord. What is man? What is man? Is man just an animal? Is man just a creature that is in this world to eat or to drink? Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, nor what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Life. These are the things I ought to think about. What is a man? Before I give myself to the world's view of life and its priorities, I should start by saying, but wait a minute, what am I? What is a man? Is a man only an animal? No, no, says our Lord, there's something bigger in you than your body, and that is your life. And life is not the same as existence. There is that within a man which is called a soul. Man's not in this world merely to eat and to drink and to buy his pleasures with his money and to cut a figure on the stage of life and to get the acclamation of men. No, no, man has got a soul. Man belongs to eternity. Man is made in the image of God. That's where you begin. You've got to start by just asking yourself that first question. What is man? Well, the Bible tells you a way back in the book of Genesis. Let us make man in our own image. Lord of creation. A creature endowed with reason and great faculties and propensities. A reflection of the almighty God. He's not just a creature. 
He's not like the animals. He's Lord of the animals. He's distinct. He's apart. That's man. Therefore, you can no longer put as your priorities eating, drinking, and the thing that can be bought with money and your clothing. No, no. There's something in me unseen, hidden. Dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. There is that within me which cries out for something bigger, vaster. That's the thing to start with. That's man. But then you see he adds to that something which is infinitely more important. And that is men in his relationship to God and his kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's to be your priority. What's he mean by this? Well, you see, having realized that I'm bigger than my body, bigger than the world in which I find myself, bigger than my lust, instincts and desires, I myself... I have a sense within me that there is a power outside me. All mankind has got it. Everybody's born with it. It's there in the most primitive races. A belief in a supreme high God. A sense that there is another. The unknown God that those Athenians were worshipping nearly 2,000 years ago. There it is. God! Begin to think about God, says our Lord. Why? Well, God is the creator. God is the maker and the sustainer of everything. It is God, he says, who's made the fowls of the air. Consider, behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not. Neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. This is great doctrine about God as the creator, as the sustainer of the cosmos, and as the great provider, the God of providence in his eternal might and glory. God! But you see, modern man doesn't think about God. He's not concerned. What shall I eat? What shall I drink? Wherewithal shall I be clothed? The pleasures I can get and the money. Fool that he is. Because the whole time he's ignoring and neglecting this God. Because men can't do without a God. He makes gods. Man's always a worshipper. He worships food, drink, clothing, himself, his own achievements, possessions, money. He worships, he serves mammon. Man's always a worshipper. And here he is, fool as he is, worshipping false gods of his own creation. And in the meantime, he's not worshipping God, the God who made the fowls of the air, the God who made the lily and the beauty of the flower and the form and the design and all the magic and the marvel of it all. And man never gives him a thought. Oh, this is madness as our Lord. Get right in your thinking about yourself. Then think of yourself in your relationship to God. And the moment you do so, he says, you'll realize that you are utterly dependent upon God. Because the animals are everything. Is It's God made us and not we ourselves. Our times are in his hand. Our breath is in his hand. God brought us into being. He could end it in a moment. We none of us control life. God controls it all. But men and women don't stop and think about that. They say, what shall I put on tonight? How shall I dress tomorrow? And they may be dead before tomorrow, but they don't think of that. You see, the whole of life is without God. God doesn't enter into the calculations. That's why the world is as it is, as our law. If only all men and women believed in God, they'd all humble themselves before him. If only the whole world believed in God tonight, there'd be no preparation for war, there'd be no jealousy and envy and rivalry. Why, all men and women would be bowing before him and worshipping him and living to his glory and his praise. But because they don't, they set themselves up. They are the gods and they worship themselves. And there's a rival god. So there's an iron curtain. I'm going to be bigger. He makes a bigger bomb, I'll make a bigger bomb. And up and up and up we go. And you get wars. Whence come they? They come even of your own lusts. You ask, but you receive not. You will never satisfy your God. And so, according to the Bible, we get all the troubles in the world, individual troubles and collective troubles, national troubles and international troubles. It's all this rivalry because man is not living as under the eye of an almighty God. And the kingdom of God. 
What does that mean? Well, this means the rule of God. This means the reign of God. This means that God, after all, is not only the maker of this world and its controller, but he is its governor. And the sooner the better we begin to discover something about his rule and his reign, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does he mean? Well, he means that God is just and holy. God is righteous. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God is perfect in all his ways. And God made a perfect world. And God meant the world to be perfect, but it's gone wrong. But God doesn't change. And God is going to put this world right. God's going to bring in his kingdom. That's what Christ said. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's come. The time is fulfilled. I'm bringing the kingdom in. I'm bringing it near. And it's a kingdom of righteousness. You see, it means this. That whether we like it or not, we are all under the eye of God. And we are all under the government of God. God is able to bless us in a manner that passes our comprehension and baffles our description. Why aren't we experiencing those blessings? I'll tell you. God only blesses those who are righteous. God curses the rebel. The wrath of God is already revealed from heaven upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Read your Bible, read your Old Testament, and you'll see that repeatedly. God blesses those who serve him, who submit themselves to him, who are righteous in his sight. This is the first thing to discover, says Christ. The kingdom of God and his righteousness His kingdom is coming. He sent his son into the world in order to establish it and to found it. And he's gathering men and women into it. And a day is coming when this son of God will return again. And finally he'll judge the whole world in righteousness. He will destroy his enemies. He will send to perdition all who have not submitted to him, all who are not righteous. And they will go to everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. There is no room for evil in the kingdom of God and there will be none. When the kingdom of God has fully and finally come in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, evil will be utterly banished. There will be nothing left. And all who belong to it will go to perdition with it. There will be nobody left except the righteous. Then shall the righteous, says Christ, shine forth as the morning sun in the kingdom of their father. But only the righteous, they alone will be blessed. Now then, what our Lord says is this. These should be your priorities. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Realize that because you're a man, you're a responsible being, that you're living your life under God that your food and your drink will vanish, that your clothing won't count. You won't be interested in them when you're on your deathbed. Men, what will Food, drink, clothing. Offer them to a dying man. Offer, to them to, offer them to somebody who's desperately ill. They're not interested. Well, says our Lord, live your life like that. Realize that nothing matters except your relationship to God and that he's a righteous and a holy God, that he's the judge of the whole world, and that he's going to establish his kingdom. Listen to Christ. Here he is, son of God. He says, I've come to tell you this. It's at hand. I'm introducing it. I'm inaugurating it. Get into my kingdom. Flee from the wrath to come. Repent. Believe the gospel. Why? Well, because you can't evade the righteousness of God and the coming kingdom and reign of God over the whole world. These are the true priorities, my friend. This is what Christianity is about. You see, there's nothing else that's saying this in the world tonight. That's why I said at the beginning that it's unique and absolutely different. The world will encourage you to go on eating, drinking, putting on your clothing, your dress, extending your life in this world. No, no, says this. 
Life is full of uncertainties. You never know what the morrow will bring forth. It's all right, says our Lord. Don't worry about that. Get right. Believe in God. Enter his kingdom. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then you've got your right priorities. So that the next question is, how are these to be obtained? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. How can I know that I'm in the kingdom of God? How can I be righteous? How can I be in a position that God will bless me? Seek it, says Christ. Put it first. Put everything else on one side. Don't read another book until you're certain of this. Don't look at another film until you're certain of this. Don't do anything until you're certain of this. Seek it first. Be urgent about it. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Isn't it obvious, my friends? Isn't this sheer logic? I say this not to alarm, but simply as a matter of fact. I was announcing here a week ago the sudden death of one of our number who had been with us on a Friday night in a service. Went to Waterloo Station as usual, saying to certain friends, see you tomorrow then. Suddenly collapsed and died in Waterloo Station. I've heard of another case, a young lady. I don't think she was quite 40. Who'd come a few times to the service here, came in to see me one night. I knew her mother when I was a little boy. She is no longer in this world. That's the sort of world we are living in, you see. My dear friend, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Believe me, food and drink and clothing and money will not be the slightest value to you when you're in this position and you may be there at any moment. Seek it first. Be urgent. Strive with all your might and main to be righteous in the sight of God. But believe me, you won't have tried for very long before you'll realize that it's an utter and a complete impossibility. The moment you pull yourself up and say, I'm a man and not a beast, I've got a soul and not merely a body, and I see that God is holy and I must be holy, God and and holiness can't dwell together, light and darkness can't mix, I must be perfect, I must cease to sin, I must live a godly, a holy life, and you begin to do it. The more you try, the blacker you see yourself. You develop a new sensitiveness that you never had before. You've got a new discrimination. And you feel you're vile, you're hopeless, you're damned. Your thoughts are evil and you can't do anything. And here you feel lost and damned. Doesn't matter. Go on. Seek. And go on seeking until you're utterly and finally absolutely desperate and lost and hopeless, and damned, and frantic, and don't know what to do with yourself. And then come back and listen to this blessed person again. He said to you at the beginning, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he said, All will be right if you do that. And you've set out and you've tried to do it and you feel further than you were at the beginning. Go back to him and you'll hear his voice as you turn round saying to you, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Carrying your awful load of sin, carrying the blackness of your own unregenerate heart, striving and all in vain, listen to him. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest for your soul. Come to me, he says, in your desperation. You're trying to make yourself righteous. Quite right, it's the obvious thing to do if you want to be in God and his everlasting kingdom, but you can't and you're realizing it. Listen, he says, I came into the world from heaven in order to give you the righteousness that you can never achieve for yourself. That's what I'm here for. I had to urge you to seek it because I had to awaken you. You'd got the wrong view. You'd got the wrong priorities. You've got the right ones now. And you see the utter impossibility. Come to me. I've come to give you righteousness. 
I've come into the world and I've lived the law for you. I've satisfied every demand of God's holy law for you. I bore your punishment in my body on Calvary's cross. Your sins are forgiven. Your unrighteousness is abolished. It's washed away and banished in my blood. Come, let me clothe you with the robe of my own righteousness. That's what he'll tell you. But he only says that to people who really seek him. He only says that to those who are desperate about themselves and their souls and their salvation. Have you sought righteousness? Have you sought to enter the kingdom of God? Oh, get up, I say, seek it. Go after Martin Luther. Give up everything. Be a monk. Fast, sweat, pray. Put on camel hair shirt. Do all that the saints have tried to do and you'll find it'll lead you nowhere. But you're quite right in trying. You're right in seeking. If you'll never ask, you'll never receive. If you don't seek, you'll never find. If you don't knock, it shall never be opened unto you. But if you do seek, you'll hear him and his gracious invitation. And he will say to you, now then, listen to me. Come after me. Let him deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me. Come wherever I lead you. Leave everything if necessary. Leave every thought and consideration. Simply follow me. That's it. And what is the result? Well, you notice. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. You see, what he means is this. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. As the Son of God and your Savior and the giver to you of righteousness. And you'll get immediate soul satisfaction. It'll be the end of your vain and useless striving. You will indeed find rest and peace for your soul. You will know, my dear friend, that all your sins are forgiven. Though they be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though you've sinned into the deepest depths of hell, they're all forgiven in the blood of Christ. And you'll know it. What a knowledge. Peace with God. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But not only that, through whom or by whom also we have access into this grace wherein we stand. Which means this, that you are given the knowledge that you are not only forgiven, but that you've become a child of God. That you are indeed a citizen of the blessed kingdom of God with all its righteousness. That God is no longer your judge, he's your father. And he loves you with a father's love and looks upon you with a piteous eye. He's counted the very hairs of your head. They're all numbered. There's nothing he won't give for you. And he'll begin to shower his blessings upon you. But you know, one of the most wonderful things of all to me is this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What does that mean? Well, it means this, you see. That now you've got a very different view of them. Before you lived to eat and to drink and to dress. And now, oh, you still eat and you drink and you still dress. But you don't live for them. You do it just because they're essential to life and no more. Your desires are so greatly reduced and you're given them all, more than you want. You're not interested. You've got a superfluity of them now. You're ready to give them to others. You lived for them once and now, oh, you see, what does that matter? You've got a new view of life. You're now more anxious to know God than anything. You don't care if you were a pauper as long as you're a child of God. You don't want to be in the highest circles of society. You'd be with the lowliest in the land if they're only Christian and they can talk to you about Christian things. You'll say with the writer of the hymn, Man may trouble and distress me, Twill but drive me to thy breast. Life with trials hard may press me, Heaven will give me sweeter rest. Doesn't matter. Once a man has entered into the kingdom of God and has received the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, 
His whole view of life has changed. This old world now to him has become a pilgrimage through which he's got to go. He sees it as a world of ugliness because of men's sin and rebellion against God. He doesn't say, isn't life marvelous, wonderful, thrilling? Oh, he says, how terrible is man. Man's inhumanity to man. Man, the creature of lust and passion and vice and evil and ugliness. Oh, it's a veil of tears, but he's got to go through it and he's ready to go through with it. But he doesn't live for it. He says, my citizenship is in heaven. From whence also I look for the coming of the Savior, who shall change this our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, whereby he is able to subdue even all things unto himself. I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. We are but strangers and pilgrims in this world, my dear friend. This is a land through which we travel. We are all journeymen. It's true of all of us here today, gone tomorrow. But if you are in the kingdom of God and have his righteousness, you know that death to you is nothing but to be ushered immediately into the glorious presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. To see him as he is. And to spend your eternity with him. You see the man who is in the kingdom of God and has this righteousness. Is a man who knows that here he mustn't expect much. But there. He has an inheritance which is in inheritance which is incorruptible and undefiled. And that fadeth not away. Reserved in heaven by God. For all who are citizens of his kingdom. For all who have his righteousness. So whatever may happen to this man in this world, he sings as he goes along. In heavenly love abiding, no change my heart shall fear, for safe is such confiding, for nothing changes here. The storm may roar about me. My heart may low be laid. But God is round about me. And can I be dismayed? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and begin to enjoy the blessings of your Father. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.